great. Thank you very much. Um, it's lovely to be back um, back in Dublin uh, and back here. I gave a talk um, six years ago, I think, on um, Germany and China. Um, what I thought I'd do this time is talk um, a little bit more about Germany's role in Europe, um, which I've described as being a semi-hegemonic role. Um, I should say thank you for the very kind introduction. I, I feel slightly um, fraudulent in the sense that um, I don't follow Germany quite as closely as I used to. Um, and um, that's really for a couple of reasons, partly because um, I kind of felt a few years ago as if I didn't really have anything new to say on Germany, partly because it seemed to me as if very much was changing in, in German um, foreign policy. Um, partly also because I've been focusing um, on other things, in particular questions around uh, democracy and the crisis um, of liberal democracy. Um, but although, as I say, I sometimes have this feeling that nothing very much changes um, in German foreign policy, the world around Germany is really changing, and that's really basically what I'm going to um, try and talk about um, a bit uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm not going to specifically talk about the implications for Ireland, but I hope we can get into that because I'd love to hear from your um, from your uh, perspectives um, what you th think this um, all means for Ireland. And I'm quite conscious. I, I will be talking about economic policy and security policy, and I'm quite conscious that in both of those areas. Um, Ireland occupies a particular space. You know, it's in the Eurozone. Uh, on the other hand, in terms of security policy, um, it's a neutral country. Um, so yeah, I would be interested in hearing your thoughts um, on that. Um, I'm not going to say very much about the, the current uh, immediate um, political crisis around the leadership of um, the CDU and who might succeed Merkel as Chancellor, um, or the future of the SPD for that matter, um, the future of the Grand Coalition, um, I'm happy to get into that in the discussion afterwards. No doubt people have questions and, and comments on that. Um, but I thought I'd just start by saying something a bit more about um, the sort of structural um, uh, situation of Germany uh, in, in, um, in Europe. Um, this has really been my argument over the last few years, is that German power is, is structural rather than a function of Merkel, um, Merkel's personality or the... the the, the, the strength of the current government. Um, I think it's, um, it's much more structural than that. So it's almost exactly a decade since the Euro crisis began um, at the beginning of 2010. It's incredible that it's a, a decade has passed since then. Um, and that really prompted this um, big debate about German power in Europe. Um, lots of people started describing Germany as a European hegemon. Um, one variant of this was the idea that Germany is a reluctant hegemon. In other words, it's not actually a hegemon, but it has the potential to be a hegemon if it would just overcome this kind of mental block that it has around leading um, Europe. But this kind of idea that um, Germany was a hege an actual or potential hegemon became something of a kind of a commonplace, um, really. It's routinely described um, in um, newspapers, um, uh, very good newspapers as being a European hegemon. Um, my argument has been that's not right, that Germany is neither an actual hegemon nor has it the potential to be um, a hegemon. Um, I think this is actually one of the lessons of European history, um, that actually Germany can't be a hegemon, um, although in 20th, in, 20th, in 20th century history, what it meant to be a hegemon was something very different from what that means um, now. But I think the lesson still holds that Germany is actually not simply not big enough um, and not powerful enough to be a European hegemon. One it is simp very simple illustration of that in the current context is if you look at the size of German GDP as a proportion of the GDP of the Eurozone as a whole. So in other words, forget Britain and the other EU member states. Well, Britain's not an EU member state anymore, but the, other, the, EU, the EU member states that aren't members of the Eurozone. If you just take the Eurozone, um, Germany makes up 28% of Eurozone GDP, which is quite big, but it's not that big. Um, um, it's not you know, above 50%. And actually, if you put France and Italy together, they make up a bigger proportion of Eurozone GDP than Germany, which I think sort of illustrates um, that um, Germany just simply doesn't have the economic resources to be a European hegemon. And I think that the events 
of the last 10 years have shown again and again that, you, that Germany can't be a European hegemon. It hasn't been able to resolve the whole series of crises that Europe has faced over the last, um, over the last 10 years. Um, and that, I would argue, is because it simply doesn't have um, the resources to do so. Um, I think the Euro crisis and the refugee crisis are particularly good examples um, of, of this, that Germany was simply overwhelmed by these two crises um, in, a way that, um, uh, in, in a way that a real hegemon wouldn't have been. Um, so my argument was that Germany is not a hegemon, it can't be a hegemon, it's actually a semi-hegemon. Um, and this was a term that was used historically about Germany in the period of the classical German question between 1871 and 1945. A German historian, Ludwig Dehio, originally used this term. Um, Halb hegemon was the original German, or semi-hegemon. Um, and what that meant in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in terms of the classical German question was that Germany was, t was too big for a balance of power um, after German unification in 1871, but not big enough to be a European hegemon. So it was in this kind of in-between position which created instability. Um, now, obviously, now the context is, is very, very different. Um, and so I've argued that although um, uh, Germany is once again semi-hegemon um, in Europe, since unification, basically, it's no longer a, in the geopolitical way, in other words, in terms of military power, that it used to be. This is rather a geo-economic version of the German question. Um, so the German question has kind of re-emerged, but in geo-economic rather than geopolitical um, form. And so Germany is a kind of geo-economic um, semi-hegemon. That's the argument that I made uh, in a book that um, was published in 2014. Um, and basically, I think that that still... Um, roughly holds. It wasn't really affected, I think, by Brexit. There was lots of speculation about that at the time of Brexit, that somehow this would kind of affect the role of Germany in Europe and change the balance between different European countries. I don't think it really changed any, any, anything. And um, the, um, the statistic that I just gave about Eurozone GDP, I think, illustrates that. Even without Britain, Germany is still not big enough and powerful enough to be a European hegemon. Um, Brexit may have increased the perception of German domination, but that, I think, is a slightly different thing. So that's basically the argument I've been making for the last, um, the last uh, few years. Um, but I do think that this semi-hegemonic position that Germany has may now be coming to an end. Um, and that's basically what um, the argument I want to make this afternoon. Um, really, for... A couple of different reasons. Um, the first um, is really that I think the German economy is is going through actually quite a big structural crisis. Um, there's been a lot of um, sort of declinism about Germany um, in the last um, few months, particularly around these economic questions. Some of you may have seen Wolfgang Minchow's column in the Financial Times on Monday, um, which was called um, Merkel's successor must confront Germany's decline. And this was really all about the way that um, Germany is now, particularly the car industry, is now vulnerable to um, what, um, what Munchau called a technology shock. Um, in particular, it's sort of failed to um, diversify into electric cars and is now having to play catch up. Um, it's also, I think, a big structural question to come back to China, which um, I talked about here last time. Um, there's, a, I think, a real challenge now for Germany. It's becoming incredibly dependent on China as an export market, again, particularly the car industry. That demand, though, is now slowing for some structural reasons which have to do with the way that China wants to do more um, indigenous innovation um, and move away from being uh, a kind of an import uh, uh, economy. Um, and, um, and so the German car industry, I think, is now facing a really, really big um, challenge um, I saw another article um, yesterday on Reuters which was comparing the German car industry to sort of Detroit in the 1970s. Um, a, the, this, this slowing of demand has led to an increase in the use of Kurzarbeit, which is where the German government essentially subsidises um, uh, German car companies to um, pay, continue to pay workers without them having to actually work because, um, because, the, because demand is, is slower. Um, so there's a kind of a, I think there's a real challenge to the German economic model, this kind of export dependent economy. Um, Germany's always been an export dependent economy, but it's become much more export dependent over the last um, couple of decades. 
um, and exports account for 50% of, of German, roughly 50% of German GDP now, which is quite extraordinary for an economy the size of, of Germany's, um, which really ought to have a much bigger um, internal um, market, uh, internal source of demand. So that's part of the story, I think, is these, these challenges um, in the German economy, and lots has, lots has been written about that. I think the second reason, though, and this is mainly what I want to focus on, is, as I say, to do with the way that the international environment around Germany um, is now changing, and in particular, um, the role of the US um, in Europe. So I think that actually the more significant um, uh, shock, actually, that happened in 2016 as far as Germany and its role in Europe is concerned is not so much Brexit as the election of Trump, actually. I think it has much more profound implications for Germany than Brexit does, actually. Um, it also, by the way, has a slightly knock-on effect um, for Britain's, re Britain's relationship with the EU and the EU's relationship with Britain. I'll maybe come to that um, a bit later. So, as I kind of suggested earlier on, this position of semi-hegemony that Germany has had wasn't exactly um, created by the Euro crisis. I think it actually goes back to German unification um, in, uh, in 1990. Um, but this position of predominance that, um, that Germany developed that really sort of became apparent, I think, with the beginning of the Euro crisis in 2010, I think developed in um, a couple of different uh, phases. The first was simply with the end of the Cold War and German unification um, itself, which increased the size of Germany and therefore its resources, but also because of the end of the Cold War meant that Germany, the unified Germany at this point, um, was no longer, um, it was much more secure than it had been during the Cold War, where it was a kind of on the, on the, literally on the front lines of the Cold War and very, very vulnerable in security terms. Um, it became much more secure after the end of the Cold War and therefore, as a consequence of that, also much less dependent, uh, particularly on the US, but also on France uh, and the UK, which had been uh, sort of security guarantors, um, significant security guarantors for, um, for Germany. So that's the, the first moment, as it were, is unification itself. And then I think the second moment, which actually is an indirect consequence of reunification, is the creation of the euro, the single currency. And with that, the transformation of the German economy that took place uh, in the 2000s. One of the consequences of which was to make the German economy much more export dependent than it had been before, as I, as I mentioned. And I think this is the part that really only became clear after the euro crisis began, but actually the shift had been, um, had been underway um, uh, before that. Um, so Germany emerges into this kind of predominant position, but I think what the election of Trump illustrated was the sort of weak foundations on which that was based. Um, that Germany was essentially uh, this position of semi-hegemony that, that Germany had, had developed um, was dependent on this particular configuration of liberal international order, and in particular the role that the US played as a provider of global public goods. Above all in terms of security, but also increasingly in the last few decades as, as, as in, in economic terms, um, not just guaranteeing the, um, the economic order, um, but also being a source of demand for Germany, um, again, for German uh, cars uh, in particular. So, you know, pr before Trump was elected, successive US administrations had accused Germany essentially of free riding in these two different ways, both in <laughs> economic terms and in security terms. In security terms, because it didn't spend enough on defence, it wasn't meeting the 2% commitment that NATO countries have. Um, but in econ there was kind of an economic free riding as well, which was basically free riding on um, demand from the US and not creating enough uh, internal demand. And this particularly became an issue after the, the Euro crisis began in 2010. There were these, uh, in the early years of the Euro crisis, as you may know, there were these rather fraught phone calls between um, President Obama at that time and, and Merkel, where Obama was um, urging uh, Germany to, um, to shift its economic um, policy. Now, the reason I think the election of Trump um, and the uncertainty about the US security guarantee that he's created, I mean, there was some uncertainty even before Trump, but he, he's really um, uh, increased um, that um, uncertainty about whether the US is committed to the security of Europe um, with his comments about NATO and, and so on. The reason I think that's so important uh, for Germany and its role in Europe 
um, is that I think what it's done is it's changed the role that military power plays in relations between EU member states. Um, until now, and for the entire period of European integration, the US security guarantee was, 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 fairly, um, was, was fairly clear. Um, and that was, in a way, the basis for European integration to take place. I mean, the um, coal and steel community happens after the creation of NATO. The entire history of European integration has taken place within this framework um, in which um, the US guaranteed European security. And one of the, the consequences of that, this way that the United States sort of pacified Europe, um, was that military power was taken out of relations between European countries. Um, the fact that France and Britain were nuclear powers and had significant conventional military resources wasn't really something that they could use in negotiations with Germany. It was to some extent during the Cold War, but as I say, with, after the end of the Cold War, it certainly was no longer something that, um, that they could use as, as um, leverage. But I think that's now changed since the election of Trump. Now that there's this uncertainty about um, the US security guarantee, suddenly the fact that France, and in a slightly different way now that it's left the EU, the UK, are these sort of secondary security guarantors for Europe, is now a factor in relations with Germany in a completely different way than it was. It was quite interesting, almost immediately after the election of Trump in 2016, a debate started in Germany, albeit in quite small sort of circles, about whether Germany needed to think again about a nuclear deterrent, either a European nuclear deterrent or a German nuclear deterrent. Quite extraordinary. Now, it hasn't really gone anywhere. The debate has kind of, you know, kept coming back. Um, but this is now a question in a way that it wasn't before. Um, and some of you may have seen that, um, that Emmanuel Macron gave a speech in Paris um, a couple of weeks ago um, where, uh, specifically about the French nuclear deterrence where he invited other European countries to start a, what he called a strategic dialogue um, about the role of the French nuclear deterrent, the force de frac, in collective security um, in Europe. Now, what was sort of implicit in that, I think, um, was the idea that you know, we would be prepared to think about some way of extending the um, French nuclear deterrent so that it could include others in Europe. But that's the beginning of a conversation, and there would clearly be some kind of quid pro quo here. And so you can start to see, I think, the way that um, French military resources now are a kind of a form of leverage in relations with Germany in a way that they weren't before. Now, this kind of brings me to um, a piece that Bob Kagan, the American, um, the American uh, foreign policy thinker, wrote in Foreign Affairs um, last year called The New German Question. Um, and he talked about the um, way that the collapse, the potential collapse of liberal international order, I mean, this was really all about Trump, really, um, the, the way that Trump is threatening the liberal international order, um, and especially the US security guarantee um, to Europe, um, could lead, he argued, to um, a return of German militarism, essentially. Um, so there's a funny way in which, although his essay was called The New German Question, um, he was actually talking about the old German question. Um, it's the geopolitical version of the German question, which is all about military power, the 1871 to 1945 version of the German question, rather than the geoeconomic version of the German question that I've been um, focusing on. Now, I, I think Kagan's wrong about this because I, I think he underestimates the degree of cultural change that there's been in Germany since 1945. Um, uh, pacifism, if that is the right word, um, uh, it's something slightly different from pacifism, but, but broadly... Um, the opposition to militarism is now, I think, so deeply entrenched in German culture, I don't see that changing. Even if tomorrow the US security guarantee were really to completely disappear, I don't actually see any possibility that Germany would um, somehow revert to its previous um, militaristic culture. Um, and you see this also in the reactions to this um, emerging debate about um, uh, a nuclear deterrent. Um, there's such opposition. I just think politically this is unrealistic. 
Um, I think there's actually another possibility, which is actually, in a way, quite optimistic, certainly compared to Kagan's rather sort of dark vision of what the, the direction that Europe's going in, the direction that Germany might go in, if the liberal international order, including the US security guarantee, were to further be eroded. Um, I think there's actually a way in which US withdrawal from Europe could help resolve the German question in its current form and could actually be good for Europe as a whole. Um, as I said, thanks to the US security guarantee, um, in the past, Germany had no need for French or British, for that matter, military capabilities. Um, and so therefore it had little incentive to make concessions to France on other issues. For example, and I think most importantly, the whole set of economic issues around the Eurozone. I think a, you know, one way of telling the story of what's happened in the last 10 years in Europe has been that Germany has refused to make concessions and reach a compromise with France to make the Euro sustainable in a way that it would have done in the past. And that, I think, in turn is to do with the way that the balance between France and Germany um, has gone. Um, and, and it basically went already after reunification in 1990, as it really became apparent after the Euro crisis began. But I think the structural shift really is after German unification, in a somewhat analogous way to what happens in 1871, when the balance of power between France and Germany also um, is, um, is destroyed. Um, and so if that's right, that a big part of the story of the Eurozone, in particular in the last decade, has been the imbalance between France and Germany. That, you know, in the past, the way that the European Union often functioned was that France and Germany would reach some kind of compromise, um, kind of a grand bargain. That's how European integration kind of functioned. That's, I think, ceased to work because the balance between France and Germany is gone. There's also another factor, which is the EU is much larger now, and so I think a Franco-German agreement is no longer enough. Um, but I think it is a kind of a precondition, particularly around these questions um, around the Eurozone. Um, and so I think there's a way in which um, this at least now creates the possibility that the balance might be restored between um, France and Germany, that France has a little bit more leverage over Germany than it did in the past, precisely because its military resources now are relevant and important to Germany in a way that they didn't used to be when it could just rely on the US. Um, and so there's a way in which I think um, actually there could be a, a new grand bargain between France and Germany that could help in particular make the Eurozone sustainable, which would obviously be good for Ireland, um, and more broadly make the European Union function again um, in, um, in, in a way that it hasn't done um, for, the last, um, for the last decade or so. Thank you very much. Thank you.